One of the great things about being a biologist is that you get out into all sorts of environments throughout the country to see the biodiversity that the country contains. And one of the areas that has been most fascinating for me personally has been the interior of Australia. One of the really stunning things about Arid Australia is not just the exceptional beauty of the place and the biodiversity it currently contains, but when you think back to even 50 years ago that it contained even more species than it does now. With respect to the native mammal fauna, Australia has lost something like 25 species over the last 200 years. It's 50% of the world's extinction of mammals have taken place in Australia. And many of those extinctions, in fact the majority of those extinctions, have taken place in the arid zone. We don't uh, often think of deserts perhaps as being places where you find lots of life and lots of different species. But in central Australia, you've got incredibly rich communities of reptiles, of small mammals, of birds. The vegetation itself is incredibly diverse. And if we remember that something like 70% of Australia is arid or semi-arid, we're talking about a very big chunk of the Australian continent. So if we can uncover the factors that promote and maintain biodiversity in these areas, then we've got a very good opportunity to understand the factors that promote and maintain biodiversity Australia-wide, and hopefully to maintain it into the future. Particularly as we're, uh, as we're looking down the barrel of climate change, we're looking at many parts of the continent and other parts of the world becoming more arid. If we can understand the processes, the factors that are important in maintaining biodiversity here, then we've probably got a, a better chance of looking at, uh, at maintaining biodiversity into the future as the, as the world begins to warm up. One of the areas that we looked at initially was the Simpson Desert. And it's a, it's a true desert. It's long red sand dunes that, uh, that go on, it seems, forever. We began in early 1990 to put our pitfall traps in to catch all the small vertebrates that we could see were running around. We thought we'd be there five or six years, we'd get all the answers to the questions that we'd begun with, and we'd be then able to move on somewhere else and explore that. But after the first five or six years, it became very clear that we were just scratching the surface. The place was so complex, the ecological processes that drive the patterns of biodiversity we were seeing are just so great and so variable over different parts of the desert and over time that we realised that we had to keep coming back through the good seasons, through the bad seasons, before and after the wildfires that affect central Australia to find out the, the great diversity of things that happen to drive the biodiversity up and down. We've got now a 20 year baseline of weather data, information on vegetation change, all the small vertebrates, the invertebrates as well. We've got 20 years of how these, these different groups go up and down and respond to environmental change. And that's going to be an excellent baseline for taking further into the future as we move into a world where the climate will be changing. So we've got the opportunity by looking now at how life copes with these sorts of extreme conditions, we've got the opportunity to predict perhaps how other parts of the world will be looking in, in 20, 25 years um, in decades to come. In addition to the, the fact the environment out there is beautiful and it just it has some magnetic quality, it gets under your skin and draws you back irresistibly every year, there are so many questions, fascinating questions from a biological, ecological point of view that you really can't wait to get back out there and keep addressing them and finding out uh, what new surprises the desert will be throwing at you.